Uh, you guys are all eating, so I'll, I'll read the scripture. But if we could just pray, and, uh, and then we'll get started. So Lord, I, I just thank you right now for bringing your people together, and Lord, uh, you Holy Spirit, you're the, you're the teacher. So we invite your presence right now to come and teach what needs to be taught, and well, it's not like 35 minutes, Lord, and, uh, and Lord, I pray what we need to learn today, we would learn it, Lord. You would spark something in our, in our minds and our way of thinking, Lord, that, that would change us to be more on your mindset. Lord, I just I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I'll tell you uh, the five minute story about how we discovered this verse. Um, so, about three years ago, uh, we were at a meeting, debriefing one of our, our big public prayer meetings that we did, I think, in McKinley Park. And uh, one of our sisters in the meeting said, we're Chicago Land United in prayer, but when, when do we pray? When do we actually get together and, and pray? <laughs> and, uh, and so we said, let's, let's create a, one morning a week where you can come from anywhere in the city and pray. And that was the thought. And then a couple months went by and we still hadn't done it. We had another meeting and the meeting kind of blew up in our face a little bit. And me and Roberta and Vance Henry, I said, when are we going to do this prayer thing? I said, Vance, get us a place. And I, let's start next week. And he got us the Firehouse uh, Community Arts Center in Lawndale. And so we started uh, 5 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. 5 a.m. so that at 6.30 you could get home before rush hour and you could come from anywhere. And we, we had a brother coming from Aurora in 40 minutes at that time of the morning, right? It was awesome. And so we kept doing that. And it started with about five of us. And sometimes we bring different people from our region. It was so interesting, the five core people, and we didn't organize it this way. North side, south side, west side, center city, and suburbs. All five regions were covered and, and were committed to that prayer meeting. And, uh, and it was one of, we, we do a listening prayer. It's a prayer where we're trying to hear from God and then pray what he's telling us. And um, one morning, it was right after kind of, a, there was this big shooting in Lawndale. And so many people got shot. They closed down the, they couldn't, they filled up one emergency room and had to go to another one because someone came in and shot up a black party. And I think a few people died, but mostly people just got hit. And Phil was talking about that. And uh, in my own prayer time, I had just bumped into this verse. I was reading through Deuteronomy, and I just bumped into this verse, and I read it that morning. And I'll read it to you now. And when I read it, it was like just one of those moments where God just lands on you. You know, and it goes from uh, just a verse to maybe there's something more going on here. And I'll, I'll read it to you. So it's Deuteronomy 21, 1 through 9. And this is the main scripture. And we're going to try to unpack it as best we can. It's probably more like an hour and a half, two hour teaching. It's the only way I think. Uh, so we'll see what happens in 30 minutes. But um, this is what it says. If someone is found slain, lying in a field in the land your, the Lord your God is giving you to possess... And it is not known who the killer was. Your elders and judges shall go out and measure the distance from the body to the neighboring towns. 
Then the elders of the town nearest the body shall take a heifer that has never been worked and has never worn a yoke and lead it down to a valley that has not been plowed or planted and where there is a flowing stream. There in the valley they are to break the heifer's neck. The Levitical priest shall step forward, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister and to pronounce blessings in the name of the Lord and to decide all cases of dispute and assault. So the priests are the police. And the judge. And the jury, often. (laughs) Then all the elders of the town nearest the body shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. And they shall declare, our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it done. Accept this atonement for your people Israel, whom you have redeemed, Lord. And do not hold your people guilty of the blood of an innocent person. Then the bloodshed will be atoned for. And you will have purged from yourself the guilt of shedding innocent blood, since you have done what is right in the eyes of the Lord. So we read that. And it landed hard on us. And Pastor Laws, who was the guy that I went for that walk, long walk back to his church that one night, and we said, you know, what we really need is a night church, because that's when people are out. Um, He was there that day. I had invited him. He came. He went home, changed his sermon, and preached on that passage the next Sunday, and sent me the audio file. And I think what landed on us, the main thing that really landed on us, is is this word here. Uh, Two words. Our responsibility. See, before this, I know we're sick, right? Um, Before this, whenever someone was murdered, the first question I asked was, do I know them? After we read this passage, the new question was, is that in my area? Right? And that's what we started praying into. Pastor Law said, what if the nearest church to the murder took responsibility Mm. for that murder Wow! and came out and prayed over that spot? So we were, we we do outreach in that area. So during the summer, we preach outside. And where we, where we do service, there's probably been five or six murders within a hundred yard radius of where we do church um, in the last four or five years. It probably goes to 20 if you think about the last 20, 20 years I've been there. And, uh, and so I took Pastor Law's sermon and I played it over the loudspeaker out there um, that next Sunday. And I said, guys, you know, sometimes when I preach, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing, this is what we're supposed to do. This sermon is more like I'm bringing us a question. What are we supposed to do with this passage as a church? I think it was that Sunday night. A Northwestern grad student was standing at a bus stop on the corner. Had just flown in, just got off over here, took the bus, up, got caught in a crossfire, was shot and killed on like a corner. I walked by everything, you know, we know. And I heard about it Monday morning in our prayer meeting. Scott, did you hear about this? And the conviction of the Holy Spirit just falls on me. This part. So just like that. <laughs> you sound like that? Yeah, yeah. You know, like when God speaks, the, the music comes in. And so 
I put this passage on an email and I sent it to every pastor I knew of in my network. And I said, we need to do this. We need to respond to this. And two weeks later, we were at that corner. And we kind of broke down this passage. And that's kind of what I want. And we've been doing that. We decided, we decided a geographical area here on the north side. A group of about 10, 15 of us pastors committed. Anytime there's a murder, we're going to show up. And we're going to read this passage. And we're going to pray over that, that space. Because it's our responsibility. That's what the scripture said. Ezekiel 12, 18, this was a, a verse. I mean, part of how God speaks to me is he'll tell me, like, go look up this verse while I'm in prayer. And I'll look it up and, and try to figure out what God's saying. Ezekiel 12, 18, just read this recently. So 17 through 20. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, tremble as you eat your food and shudder in fear as you drink your water. Say to the people of the land, this is what the sovereign Lord says about those living in Jerusalem and in the land of Israel. They will eat their food in anxiety and drink their water in despair for their land will be stripped of everything in it because of the violence of all who live there. The inhabited towns will be laid waste and the land will be desolate. Then you will know that I am the Lord. What struck me about that was the violence is not the judgment. The land being stripped, I think that that's famine, right? That's locusts, right? Like we know Joel. What struck me about that is God is saying you are responsible my people, for the violence that's in your land. Now that's, I don't know about you, but that's like, really, God? I'm worse. How about this, the shooters? Or it's this community, right? But, you know, I live in that community. And even in the community, everybody's like, yeah. even the shooters are like, I sat in the room with the shooters going, we just buried somebody last week and now we're doing it this week. What can we do about it? They feel like it's happening to them. Right? And this seems to be like what violence does. Right? And that's how the enemy comes. He's an abuser. Right? How did he come at Eve? Did God really say? Like he gets right, right and he goes to Eve. It's totally out of order. He's doing it on purpose. He's crossing boundaries, right? That's what abusive people do. Mm -hmm. They cross the boundary and it frees you up, right? Mm -hmm. That's what Goliath did to Israel, right? He jumped out, got in their face, and they were scared. And one pastor said that. He said, Scott, I want to be there because I feel like the violence in our city is like Goliath. And it has us shrinking back and not knowing what to do. And so we began to, to decide, well, we're going to go out and go after this. And so I think that what I love about this passage is it's our responsibility. Because we're the priests. We're the kingdom of priests. All right? And, and, uh, and especially the pastors need to own this, right? And so we started doing it two and a half years ago. And honestly, where we have done it, it we're almost down to zero homicides in the places where we have really gone. Our neighborhood, I don't think has had a murder in a year and a half. Um, it's pushed other places. And that's part of why I wanted to do this workshop today. Because when we first started doing it, I was only doing it because God told us to. I really didn't understand it. I was like, what is up with this? I don't, I don't even know why we're doing this. God, we're just out here. We're reading this passage and taking communion afterwards. 
That's what we're just going to do and pray here. And then things started changing. And I'm like, wow, this seems like it works. Why does it work? And I'm not sure I've got that all figured out. That's kind of the question I'm putting to God's people today. Right? Let's look at this passage and figure out why does this work? Why would God even ask us to do this? Because it's a really weird passage. All right. It says, anyone got their Bible open? I want you to just kind of take a look at that passage. And what I love to do when I read the Bible, uh, the Deuteronomy passage. Yeah, Ezekiel is just kind of a stop along the way here. But So Deuteronomy 21, 1 through 9. What I always like to do when I look at a passage is two questions. Where have I heard this before? Where have I heard this before? And what in this passage bugs me? What in this passage, based on what I know about the way things should be, isn't? So if y'all could just take a minute, look at that passage, and I want to hear what bugs you about this passage, or where have you heard something where did you hear something that you've heard before? So anybody got some questions? Yeah. I don't know if it's a question, but it just stands out to me. That, that first verse. It's the man your God is giving you to possess. And so what stands out to me when we talk about being the people of God and taking the land... <laughs> It's God giving for our possession. And so I feel like that goes along with the responsibility that you will have. Okay. And that's deep, right? Because what land has been given us to possess? All of that, that's a, what'd you say? All of the land. All you of know, it. You know, I just want to add. Yeah. Back in Genesis, Mm-hmm. When he say he give us dominion, mm-hmm. and so when you say possession, I'm going back to Genesis where he say he give man dominion. dominion. Mm-hmm. All right. Woo. Yeah, gave man dominion. All right. So as I've, I've just just a few sides as I've thought about this, when Jesus sends out the seventy or seventy two. 70, 72 is a significant number because that's the known nations and that and the mindset of those people. So when Jesus sends out 12, we get that. When he sends out 72, we're like, what's up with 72? 72 was the known nations. All right? There's passages in Deuteronomy that talk about that God took Israel as his own nation and gave the other nations to these other lower gods, right? Which we would call powers and principalities. When Jesus sends out the 72, what is he saying? We're taking it back. Right? So the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So what land is our possession? All of it. All of it. Right? All of it. Yes, sir. also reminded of the patriarchs, the promise that was made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and Joshua was the fulfillment of that. Wherever the soul of your feet shall travel, it's yours to possess. Right. So actually, the land where it belongs to us. And, and so, as priests, we are ones who are given the responsibility. Yeah. Right. So, Joshua. Now this is getting exciting now, right? <laughs> right? Yes. And when Joshua went, did he like, you know, they didn't just stay in their little tabernacle, right? They had to go do what God told them yeah. to take the land. Yeah. Right? It's, it's engaging. Yes. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Stand out or bug you? Or... I'm, that's an unexpected thing, or I don't get that. I got my own. I'll throw them out in a minute if, if you don't hit them. But, but 
is this um, cat? If um, the scripture Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty one twenty one one um, through nine. Oh, uh, twenty one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, a lot won't make sense if you're on 29. <laughs> All right, because we don't have much time, I won't wait too long. All right. Um, it bugs me they take this ox and break his neck. Because what are, what are you thinking is going to happen to that ox when they grab an ox? In the sacrifice, right? That's what we usually do to animals. It's a blood sacrifice. This is not a blood sacrifice. And uh, if we had more time, I was going to have different stations and stuff with verses, but I'm just going to go there. So in Exodus 13... Okay, that's what I'm going to explain. Um, yeah. So I was, I, was, I was like, what is up with this? Right? And so then you've got to ask, where have I heard this before? Mm-hmm. So there were two things. There was one thing that came to my mind about a broken neck. And that's um, Eli. Mm-hmm. Eli, who will not confront his sons who are doing evil. And when God kills him, he breaks his neck. So... I looked up the word for break his neck there. It's not the same word. So I had to go back to the wrong word. But there is a word for the same word for breaking the neck. And it's from Exodus 13, 1 through 10. I'll read that to you now. Moses said to the people, remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, because the Lord brought you out from there by strength of hand. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib, you are going out. When the Lord brings you into the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this observance in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days, No leavened bread shall be seen in your possession, and no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory. Is this? I don't know. This isn't it. Yeah. Okay. It goes further down. Let me look this up. So basically, further down. Is it verse 13? Which, of course, I did not print out. Can you read that for me? Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Right. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. Right, right there. So you hear this passage, right, of the unleavened bread, which is in remembrance of the Exodus. The Exodus and going into the promised land. And so check this out. If you have a donkey that's born, and it's the firstborn of that female donkey. Like, firstborn's a big deal in Scripture, right? I mean, if you even think about it, God created Adam first and Eve later. So right away, at the very beginning of Genesis, you have a firstborn and a secondborn, right? Adam and Eve, right? And so, like, right away. And then our next firstborn and secondborn, it's not a happy story, came in here. We'll look at that in a All right? So this idea of breaking a neck takes us back to an animal of labor that if it's born, the only way you can keep it alive is if you sacrifice a lamb in its place. And then you can keep that donkey alive. If you don't do that, you have to kill that firstborn. Because it belongs to the Lord. Because it belongs to the Lord. Mm. Yeah, so try to figure that out. All right? Like, right? I mean, in some ways, this, this passage is God handing us a puzzle. It really is. Right? right? It's for God to conceal a matter. It's, 
is for kings to seek it out, right? So what's up with that? What do you think is up with that? Tell us. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm not sure I know, but um, one thing I do know is though is you can't make a blood sacrifice for a murdered person. The, the blood of animals cannot redeem a murder. Right? If you murdered somebody, the only way you're getting off the hook is that you're going to die. That is the rule. There's no make a sacrifice for that sin. And so it's like, I think part of it is that. The, the blood of an animal is not a good enough sacrifice to cover the sin of murder. Yes. And when you do this, you're, you're acknowledging that. Mm-hmm. Right? It can't be redeemed. Yeah, because God said, no shall not kill. Right. And that's a command. Right. And so, and so that, that's kind of like a second principle. This is primarily an offense to God. I think this is so important. You know, the scripture I got this morning in prayer is from Exodus 6. It was about where God said, I will bring you out of Egypt. I will put you in the promised land. I will make you my people. It's I, 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 I. It's not us. Right? And I think in some ways this, 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 Doing this is like marching around Jericho seven times. The power of it, we don't bring the press. We don't make a big deal about it. We show up and we pray. Because it's only before God. It's invisible. You remember that, I don't know if you guys ever seen Chernobyl, the HBO documentary, there's a moment in Chernobyl where the whole thing is blown up and they're literally out there picking up the bricks and they're not covered and so what they can't see is killing them what they can't see is killing them and they're dead already they just, it just, they don't know it yet but in their mindset I'm just picking up bricks from an explosion. And there's something about the invisible realm and about doing this that takes us into the spiritual realm and it's really about faith. And you know, sometimes God needs us to to kind of do something because he told us to. Yeah. The first man born on this planet was murdered. The second man born was his victim. And the third man born was the solution. And those are the only three roles we'll ever play in life. We're either going to be the, the victim, a murderer, or the victim, or we're going to be the solution. And I think part of what this is, is there was a murder that took place. And we bring God's perspective to it. And we uh, balance the account, as it were. Because there's, it's life for life here. And, because you, uh, and the Lord allows the life, and not a sacrificial life. This is undignified here. The breaking of the net is commensurate to hanging, because curses the man that hangs on the tree. And murder is a curse, and the breaking of the neck is to transfer that curse of murder onto this animal. So, and, and I think the, the New Testament equivalent is for us to acknowledge it as the leaders of a community 
and take some of the shame because I, we travel and we hear people say to us about, oh, you're from Chicago, murder capital, and, and there's shame associated with that. Yeah. And we have to own that, on that spot. And there's not a heifer to break the neck, but we have to own that shame and declare and not let it go unobserved because too many times we walk over the spot. I mean, we almost almost step over the body and keep doing our thing. And us as the priests of a community have to call attention to it and stop everything and make observation of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So I was, so I don't have this whole thing like that, but I was just thinking about why and maybe it's what you're doing is working. So when we look at scripture and especially the Old Testament, when we look at that, we see that the when God visited Noah, He told him to build him an altar and make a sacrifice, and He would visit him there. And we look at things in in the demonic realm, it works the same, but in the opposite. So when there is a murder, it is actually creating an altar for these things to it opens up the right. atmosphere for them to right. continue. But when you come yeah. and you pray this thing and you are taking communion, that word in Psalm 91 that talks about he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. That word there, shelter, is blood stain. And that's talking about covenant. So when you're taking communion, you're bringing the covenant of Jesus Christ with his blood that speaks a better word than bulls and goats right. over to cover and break, almost nullifying the sacrifice that was that's made good. to allow these things to continue to happen in the community and stops it. So each one that you go to, it breaks the altar so that, so just like God says, he will visit you if you make the sacrifice from his altar. Demonic forces visit these demonic altars. Yeah. But when you come with the blood of Jesus that washes that away, it cancels it. It closes the door That's for good. that stuff to continue happening in the community. So each time you do more, it shuts it down. That's good. Okay. Yeah. 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 is because Jesus, by his death and resurrection, he's the fulfillment. He paid the price for that. And we're not to do the sacrificial Old Testament rituals. So how does that play out in light of the death of Jesus Christ? So this is what bugs me is we do not observe the sacrificial recognitions that are in the Old Testament. So how do we go forward? Yeah. 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 But we have a, a sacrificial Jesus. Jesus and, a, and, a communion. That's and we have a, a but, observance. But, that, but that's not the communion is the remembrance, right? So I'm just saying we do not recognize other sacrificial um, sins or errors. So but the Lord came to fulfill. Yes, that's so what so I'm saying. he's saying, what I'm saying when we go and we go to those spaces. We bring the fulfillment yeah. of the, the sacrifice land, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. We bring the fulfillment of that. It's I totally get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. We're not like doing these old things from the right. old Right, trying testament. to make another ritual. Right, right. You know, a right. sacrificial ritual. No, that's know? that's a that's a great that's something that bugged me about it too. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, if the Holy Spirit had dropped it on us, I would have thought the same thing. But then we start doing it, and everybody's mm -hmm. doing it. So, like, okay, Jesus, it seems like this matters to you. And, and, like, and, what's and, going on here? And the truth be told, we do have a ritual. Communion is a ritual that we have. It's a, but we, it was given to us by God. And, he, and, and these rituals that were given, given to Jew, uh, the, the Jews, they were rituals from God. That's why the Jews had so much difficulty embracing Christianity because these things that they got, I mean, Moses came out of the mountain with his face shining and told them to do that these were from God. And, and it had to, they had to unlearn that and relearn this. But these, our communion 
is our New Testament ritual that we do on a regular basis. But it is a ritual. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just want to... And thank you. What's your name? Kim. Kim. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're the answer I was looking for. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 If you hadn't got there, I was happy. Sorry. <laughs> All right. All right. But, but I didn't get that till the last response of murder we did. Oh. And an African pastor was like, look, blood has a voice. <laughs> right? Blood has a voice. Yes, yes. He said, the cry is from the ground. But the yes. blood of Jesus Amen. speaks of better things. Hallelujah. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Oh, oh, hey. Hey. Uh, the thing is, we were not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spirits in high places. So, point blank, the rituals, as y'all call them, religious rituals of the Old Testament, don't apply in today's uh, New Testament times, as they call them, people separate. And to me, separation is a tool of the enemy. You cannot separate the word of God because it don't come back empty or void. It just is, and it speaks truth. So the blood that cries out from the ground, the first blood that cried out from the ground was Abel when Cain right. slew him in right. heaven, the first murder. Everything that we're being punished for or going through always goes back to the garden. When Adam and Eve fell out of grace, I don't get into religious doctrines because I've studied mostly all of them. And the point is, it's about spirituality. And like she said, demons are real. Satan took a third of them, angels that fell from heaven. Demonic possession is real. Transference is real. God set up laws. So. It was, a, it was a prayer group we had the other day, and my brother asked, is there such thing as free will? He had a problem with believing it. And I always let people know it's the greatest gift God gave us, the right to choose him, because it puts us in relationship with him. Yeah. He said, be careful who you choose to serve. You can't serve two masters. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve the world. We're in a world system. The way it's out of chaos is because people keep trying to govern the physical by the physical. Mm -hmm. We have to live in this world spiritually, especially now. Mm -hmm. So the blood that was shed on Calvary negates all other blood that was ever shed because it's the blood of Christ. It washes us over. Communion, he tells you, as often as you remember me, you can take communion 24 hours of the day. It's not a ritual. It's a discipline in a, a spiritual way of life. See, once we separate rituals, religious doctrines, and all this, and Satan tries to use us to separate henceforth uh, Jews, Hinduism, Buddhism, and all this stuff, the Tower of Babel, the confused man, because man tried to reach God, not as God wanted to be reached. Mm -hmm. So he confused them in their language. Right, right, right. Brother. Right. Um, so, I'm, I was wondering what you just said right here. Um, kind of um, talking to what I'm thinking because like, you, you said something back then that when a person had killed and then God said you should not kill, um, it, it seems like it was on forgiveness. But what I understand about um, the autonomy of Jesus Christ that has died for all sins and know that we, we, we learned that the only sin you cannot be forgiven is when you ask me, it's the Holy Spirit of God. So, even the murderer, I still believe that they have, uh, 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 they, they have a forgiveness because, because the, 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 the tournament of Jesus Christ was, covers every blood that we speak about, everything that we speak about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and he, he opened up the way for us Come repentance right, right. sincerely. Yeah, yeah. So, Mark, what do you got? I wanted to ask you. I'm. A, I like to know specifics. So, I want to know how do you find out about the murders? How do you rally pastors? How do you choose times right, right. to do all that? And how do you orchestrate? Yeah. I don't know. I don't. I know yeah. I got a few minutes, but do you so have it's basically we watch we watch the news, and Donovan's my friend. 
Mm -hmm. And Donovan sends me a text anytime someone's shot sure. up north. He usually knows before I do. Um, mm -hmm. And once we know someone was murdered someplace, I send out an e I, I send out an email to a group of pastors. Um, there's kind of my usual suspects. I text them first, find out what night, day can you make it, and then I send out an email to everybody when we go there for like half an hour. That's how we do it. I just want I want to follow up just on one thing she said. Just just a thought. Go back to Abel. All right. So right before Abel was killed, what happened? They had to come too. Cain makes an offering that is a is a not a good enough offering. Right. And Abel offers the firstborn from his life. Right. All right. First That's an hour long conversation. I'm not going to get into that. But God comes to Cain and says, "If you will do the sacrifice that your brother does." You'll be fine. But sin mm -hmm. is outside your door. Crouching at your door. And it wants to master you. Right. And so what does the sacrifice do? It masters the sin. The sacrifice keeps sin outside the door. What happens because he doesn't make that sacrifice? He kills him. So what does that tell you? He was mastered by the sin. So I agree with that. That points towards, that supports what you're saying. If we're wrestling against powers and principalities and people are building altars through murder and through, through participating in, in drug stuff, which we'll talk about in two weeks, all right, or two months, they are inviting slavery into their community. They're inviting their minds to be enslaved. Yes. So someone has to interrupt that and come out. And actually, when you do deep study into why the priests do this stuff, it was so that Israel was holy ground. Right. Yeah. Right? They sent the, the, the scapegoat out of Israel to right. take the sins out of the sacred ground, ground and leave it out there. If you allow your land to be polluted, God gets up and leaves and you have a covenant with him as the great nation that protects you. And if he leaves, you're in trouble. Yeah. So when we do this, we are bringing a, a protection over our community. We're going right to where the enemy came to bring mastery over our kids and where he did master somebody and got them to kill somebody. And we're, we're breaking that. And I think that's why spiritually when we do that, we start to see murders go down because the demonic forces that are pushing these things are told you can't be here anymore in the spiritually realm. Now that, that's what a priest does. A priest brings God's presence into a space then where there's God's presence. You can't have that. You can't anymore. come in. Right. All right. Right? And so that's, I think that's a big part of what this is. And there's one more thing. The story of Stephen. Right? We talk about the blood of Jesus, which speaks of better things. Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen, when he is murdered, right? his last words are, Father, forgive them. His blood, his words, the same as Jesus. His blood cries out for a different thing, too. And his cry hunts down a man named Saul. A murderer. Yeah, that's and grabs him and turns a murderer into an apostle. And so now what we do when we go out there, the way we pray after we do communion, <coughs> is God hunt the murderer down. Yeah. Amen. Hunt him down and yes. bring him into the kingdom. Yes. That's good stuff. Amen. That's good. 
Uh, last, uh, last word, brother, and then you can close us in prayer. That, that is interesting because if we look at this passage, it, it's talking about the priests, and the priests were given territory of Israel, 12 tribes, they were responsible. The pastor said the priest and his closest to the murder. That's his responsibility. Now we are so caught up in the four walls that we are not penetrating our communities. Right, thank you. And so we think it's the police job. Exactly. And we are forfeit our responsibility. Yeah. Which give birth to crime and violence. Because as long as the church remains in the works, Great. powers of darkness will continue to overrun oh, our city. Space. Space. Our city. The church should be the ones who are policing the community. Thank right. you. And that is what Stephen, because remember the, the apostles, they were under persecution. They accused Stephen of blaspheme against God. You, you are against the law. You are saying this temple is not the place. And all of these accusations, and Stephen took them back to the Old Testament. He talks about Joseph, Moses, and so forth. Paul was there. Yeah. And I'm saying when the church yeah. stands up and plays its role, sinners will be saved. Say yeah. it. Because the Bible says on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were saved. 3,000 were saved. Some of those folks are the same people who crucified Christ. Same one. When Jesus same says, forgive them for their same Lord, the Bible says, priests were added to the church. And I think we have an awesome responsibility as priests. Because we need to know we are priests of the Lord. Thank you. And so the Old Testament is a shadow of the new. So the broken lamb is Christ being crucified for us. And that blood is shed. Yeah. Uh, and so I think what we are doing here is pretty much what God wants us to do. And I believe, I personally believe, COVID is designed by God. Go Get us say. outside. <laughs> I strongly believe that yeah. because now we are impacting the community. Yes. Yeah. Now we are building that relationship with yeah. the community there that we have go. never had. There you go. Yeah. There you there are go. churches and communities that the people don't know. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. And they have been there for a long time. Yeah. Pastor doesn't visit the community. The members don't want to go to the community. Nobody knows these church, yeah. these churches. And so now, through COVID, we are building relationships. Pray for us, brother. Can you close us in prayer, brother? Come on, brother. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Hallelujah. we thank you for this awesome privilege. Yeah. We yeah. thank you for the opportunity that we can exchange thoughts. Iron yes. sharpened iron. Yes. Yes. So is the countenance of one man. In the name of Jesus. God help us to understand who we are and whose we are. Hallelujah. You have given us the power to yes. tread and serpent yes. and scarpet, yes. and nothing shall harm us. Hmm. You told Joshua, wherever the sole of your foot shall tread, it is the earth to possess. Yes. I will be with you. Hallelujah. What a commitment hmm. that you will be with us wherever we go. Yes. No man. Yes, no man shall be able yes. to stand before us, Amen. for we are more than conquerors. Yes, we are, we, are we, we, we are given that charge. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord, not to be afraid. Hallelujah. When fear knocks at the door, faith will open up. Yes, yes, Spirit of the living God, bless yes, every heart represented in this. Revive us, Lord God. We can the fire. Help us to arise. Hallelujah. And to take responsibility yes. and to reclaim our community. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.